Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Tanya, and I'm an alcoholic. I like to say I'm an alcoholic who will go to any lengths when it comes to alcoholism, which you will hear in my story. Uh, There's a part in the book in uh, There is a Solution that says, uh, further on, on, clear-cut directions are given showing how we recovered. These are followed by 42 personal experiences. Each individual in the personal stories describes in his own language and from his own point of view the way he established his relationship with God. These give a fair cross-section of our membership and a clear-cut idea of what has actually happened in our lives. This is the applicable part when it comes to my story. We hope no one will consider these self-revealing accounts in bad taste. Our hope is that many alcoholic men and women desperately in need will see these pages or stories, and we believe that it is only by fully disclosing ourselves and our problems that they too will be persuaded to say, yes, I am one of them too, I must have this thing. My sobriety date is January 10th, 2012. I got sober in uh, Fresno, California. If you're looking for a bottom, you can find it there. I highly suggest it. I highly suggest it. Um, I have a home group. It's um, the Friday night meeting of Pathfinders, and I have a sponsor. His name is Rick, and he knows he's my sponsor. And we... Why are you guys laughing? Why is that funny? Uh, And we do step work, and we meet regularly, we talk, and I fully disclose myself to him because accountability is something that I discovered in Alcoholics Anonymous works very well for me as much as at times I don't like it. Um, My story is a lot like a lot of other people's. I drank a lot of alcohol, a whole lot. It was never enough, but I drank a lot, and it earned me a seat here in these rooms. I grew up in a household that did not have alcohol. In fact, it was completely anti-alcohol. My mom is, I like to say she's an untreated Al-Anon. We had an uncle who lived in my home who drank excessively. And I remember her getting up in the middle of the night after he had passed out to put chalk marks on the tires to see if he would get up and drink and drive the car. But the funny part is she never addressed it. She just knew he did it. He did it again and never addressed it and just carried around that hostility and that bitterness and that, as we call it, resentment. You know, uh, she said it was just being (laughs) well-informed. Making informed, no-action decisions. So that's the household I grew up in. Uh, It was a very extremely religious home. We had a lot of focus on God. We had a lot of focus on church, sometimes four times a week, sometimes every night for a month, twice on Sundays. Um, We had like the, people jokingly call it the snake handling type of church. That's, That's what I grew up in, with a very strong belief in a God that was hellfire, damnation, wrath, and they liked to pray demons out of me and my sister in the back room when we were 12. And we, I was a pretty average normal girl, but this higher power that I had was, um, was pretty extreme. And I grew up knowing I could never, ever accomplish what needed to accomplish to go to this heaven that I learned about. I was never going to make it. And there was no amount of work that could be done that was going to get me there. That was clear. I remember being 13, 12 years old and praying at this altar in my church for an hour, like it had closed and I'm still praying and I'm like 12, 13 and my hands are raised and I'm crying and I don't even know what I did. Like I seriously don't even know what I did, but I just knew that was the right place to be. And it went on like that for some time. Don't let me forget. I also had a house with a lot of violence. A lot of violence. I had a very angry mom, as we discussed. Rightfully so, maybe. I don't know. But she was extremely angry. There was a lot of things out of her control there. And she did a lot of yelling. Shoot, I hope she doesn't hear this. Dang it. Uh, she, know, she knows she yelled. Let's just, she knows. Uh, but she did a lot of yelling and a lot of hitting with belt buckles. 
you know, that where you wrap the belt around your hand and you hit with a buckle, um, clothes hangers, shoes on the way to church, um, turn around and get you with a shoe, and then we'd get out of the car and it was, act like nothing's wrong. Nothing is wrong. Just, just act, well, hold hands, walk into church. So I learned really early that we're not supposed to, like, have problems, right? You know, this is like the 80s, and it's upper, uh, upper middle class America and in our station wagon, and you don't act like anything's wrong. So I picked up that skill really early that later bit me in the ass, you know. So I, I went through life that way, going to church, and there's a part in Bill's story where he talks about, you know, um, moments sublime with intervals hilarious. He was part of life at last, and in that time he found liquor. And that's my story. The first party I ever went to, I met the one. We were married. Two years later, still in high school, the nice little addition coming. We got married when I was 16. There was a very rural area. There was nothing else to do. And, <laughs> and serious. Uh, it was Paso Robles, if you know where that is. Yeah. Yeah, see? Yeah. Yeah. So we got married, and we went off on this journey. And I, he was in the military. He worked for Department of Defense. He was a fireman. And all these external things. And I have this beautiful baby. And life should be okay. I, gra- I was really intelligent. I graduated high school at 16. I was going to college to be a court reporter by the time I was 18. And, and it was good. On the outside. It really was. In fact, I went back to my high school and they said, you're not welcome here. You make it look good. Girls are going to have babies. You're going to make this look good. You can't be here. And it was interesting because it should have been pretty good inside, but it wasn't. You know, it talks, I hadn't, by the way, I really hadn't drank yet. I was, because I was 16 and I was pregnant. So that's, I made a good choice there. But I, (laughs) It gets worse. So I, I, I've I, got this baby, and I'm just, it talks in the doctor's opinion about restless, irritable, and discontented. And I was. Man, I was. You know, I was resentful that I had to have this baby. I was resentful that, you know, I didn't get to be with my friends. I was resentful that I had to start college. I, I just, I couldn't find things to be happy about. And that troubled me more because I had this guilt of, shouldn't I be happy? You know, I have this, this really cute husband and we have this house and we have all these things. Why am I not happy? And I'm just like mind screwing myself with that. I'm not happy, but I should be. And, and that started like that journey. And when I was about 19, I started drinking, you know, I started, I started really drinking because it was cool at that age. You know, we had our own house, and people would come over, and we had money, and it was the 90s, so we discovered cocaine, and that just made it fun until it wasn't, you know. So with all that, at 19, I have another baby. Do them, All that is all combined into one story. Yeah, the cocaine, alcohol, baby, it's all there. And... <laughs> Yeah, but I I have this baby now because things were a little rocky anyway. They just were a little rocky because I wasn't happy. And he kind of wasn't happy either because now he's got this wife that he met when she was 14 years old. And it's, it's just weird. And it's, it's, he's not coming home or when he does, he says, and I quote, my check must have fell out of my pocket. I've got 50 bucks left. And I'm like, but if your check fell out, where'd you cash it? You know, how'd you do that? And it's just this thing. It's just this power thing. And we did this for like 11 years. And I'm drinking because I have a bad marriage. And I have a bad husband. And I've got these two friggin' kids. And they're getting in the way of this career I'm trying to start. And which I don't even really want to do anyway by that time. And nothing's enough. Nothing's enough. Nothing's good enough. And I'm finding that even there's not enough alcohol. You know, there's just not. So... He and I part ways, and I've got these two kids in tow, and I go to work for this attorney, and I'm 25 years old. And he's actually my divorce attorney. He actually is. And he he was doing it for me for free. And he actually included this. This is a great deal. He included a house with it for me and my kids. 
um, in a city called Cayucas, if you've ever been there. It's like this awesome little beach town. And he had a bar. Yes. And he said, if I was his secretary during the day, I could be a bartender at night to make extra money. And I'm like, that is bonus. Yes, I will do that happily. So I'm doing that. And the thing, here's the beauty of Alcoholics Anonymous, because I realize how distorted that four step kicked my ass when it came to, to turning, you know, false into reality. Uh, on my 25th birthday, he and I, I had this boyfriend, great boyfriend. He had a girlfriend, but he was my great boyfriend. He was good. I liked him. Yeah. And this was like for a year. And he threw me this party at this pool hall with like, like 75 people there, my friends. And I go to lunch because, see, I don't understand what's happening with alcohol. I'm just thinking that life's shitty. And I got these kids and this husband and this ex and nothing's good enough. And I have to pay for this divorce at this, like, crappy law office. And I'm drinking a lot because I'm 25 and that's what you do. So it's my birthday. And we go to his bar at noon for lunch where I have a couple shots. Quite a couple. And then we go to lunch, and that's the last thing I remember, was being at this lunch on this golf course. I was 25 then, and I got sober when I was 40. I'm 47. And I, th- I woke up in a hot tub having sex with this, doc- this, this lawyer, my boss. And I was like, he roofied me. <laughs> he raped me. What, what the hell? And I jump out of this hot tub and I run down because it's like this cool place. They're like on the sides of hills. And I run down in the bathroom and I'm crying because I'm a victim and all this happened to me. And I tell this girl, I'm like, oh my God, I'm getting raped by my boss. And she's like, how bad do you need your job? (laughs) And I was like, this was in the nineties guys. The women's rights weren't as big. And, and I said, I need my job bad, real bad. And then she said, you probably ought to go back up there. I'm not kidding. And I did because I didn't know what else to do. And I stumbled my way up this hill and I tell him, I need to go home. I need to go home. And he's like, okay. And he, he takes me back to the law office and I drive home. It's on this back country road. It's 20 miles. And I straddle the white line in the middle and I drive the 20 miles home. It's really rural. It wasn't that big of a deal, but I get home and my best friend's like, what happened? What happened? And I didn't tell her cause he was also her attorney. But I didn't tell anyone. But that night, I missed my 25th birthday party. And I didn't tell anyone because I had a lot of shame about what had happened. And I come into work the next day, and it gets worse. He's like, hey, I left my wife. I left my wife. I'm like, don't do that. He looked just like, like a really messed up Bill Clinton's older brother. Like it was bad. I'm like, no, don't leave your wife. Don't do that. So... I continued working there as a victim until he fired me. And like a couple months later for stealing alcohol and from the bar and life just went out, went on like this. And what I didn't know is that night, that day on my 25th birthday, that there's something in our book called the phenomenon of craving and that I don't respond well like other people because that was my birthday. I was not drinking to escape I was not drinking for any reason, but from there's this weird thing. When I drink one, I change my mind. I'm only going to drink one, and I change my mind. I'm going to only drink two, and I change my mind. And I don't know where it's going to end, but it's probably not going to end well. And it's not going to end with a single-digit amount of alcohol. So I I just didn't know that. And now as I look back through my life, there's so many examples where today I'm not drinking and I could take a polygraph. Like I could take a polygraph. You know, I'm sorry. My, my, some of my stories are very distasteful. My, I have a young man. He actually spoke here a while back. He's my son. And I woke up when I was 30 and he was a year old and I had thrown up all over him and he's asleep and he's got it on his face and he's asleep. And I said, that place has the worst food. Like, I really meant that. 
Like, I got food poisoning more times than any human being could have ever possibly got. I've, tra- I've probably put restaurants out of business trashing them. Like, because they have bad chicken, bad seafood, and you'll puke. Watch. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't drink tequila. I used to think that's because it didn't sit well with me. No, I just get screwed up on tequila. You know, I drink a lot of it. So, I'm just going to stick to beer. I never drank beer. Um, but it's, I look back over my life at how many times I had these great plans of how I was going to control my drinking. You know, and I don't, if, here's, if I knew, let's say I was going to go to someone's house and they're like, oh yeah, I bought us like this bottle for like the six of us girls. <laughs> Here was the mind screw of all of that. I'd be like, I'm good. I'm good. No, because I knew something in me when I drank two of those or one of those or smelled it practically that I need more. I need more and you have to get out of my way. I need more. And if you hold my keys and you're not going to let me out, I'm going to go through your medicine cabinet and I'll find something to calm that out, that craving for alcohol. In the meantime, you know, I'll go through your purse. The, are, you know, are those, what are those things? Are those Tic Tacs or are those Valium? We'll find out when you go to the bathroom. I don't know. <laughs> It's true. You all act like you've never went through medicine cabinets. You want to know the best one? I knew someone that put bouncy balls at a party in their medicine cabinet. So if anyone opened it, they all came out. That, that's smart. <laughs> yeah. I didn't do that anymore. And I wasn't even the one they did it to. It's pretty smart. Pretty smart. Yeah. <laughs> that's all true. <laughs> yeah. What do you do? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, I thought I could control it because sometimes I'd turn it down. But I realized I really only turned it down on the times when I knew there would never be enough. You know, because I'm the girl who leaves parties, her own party, to go get alcohol at a club 40 miles away. Like, I did that. You know, I did that. That's because that's how I am. Because when I take a drink, it takes me. And I'm along for the ride, and I don't know where we're going. I don't know what we're doing. And my life got to this point, I don't know who I'm victimizing, and I don't know who I'm using. But you're going to be on one of those lists. You're going to, I'm going to hurt you, or I'm going to take from you, which is probably going to hurt too. And so I go through this life, you know, on the outside. For many, many years, that life looked a lot like the life I have now, on the outside. I had good people in it. I had a nice home. I had friends that came around. I had people that called. I had a job. And I just, I could get these things. I just couldn't keep them. Or if I got them, I just wasn't content with them. You know, there's this guttural thing in me that I need more. And it wasn't just alcohol. Or I need different. Or I need to go. Like, I just need to go. I don't even know where I'm going, but I got to go. I got to go. You know, that's... And unfortunately, that doesn't always go away. I moved to Florida for a month last year in sobriety. I moved back. Yeah, there's way too many banjos. Oh, there's no, ban- no banjo players here. I don't mean that bad. It's figurative. But it's bad. So, yeah. You know you can still smoke inside there and ride in the back of a truck, and you don't have to wear a helmet. Yes. It was interesting. So I have this life that I would just leave. I would just leave. I would just walk away from it if something got uncomfortable. Because you see, in a house where you grow up like I grow up, the best tool you have is this: get this big and get loud and get mean. Like that worked when I was like that worked. That was the household I grew up in, and I was able to use that tool for a while to get through life. But I found that my world got smaller and smaller. You know, my my craziest crazy. I mean, crazy crazy friend. She sat me down towards the last couple years of my drinking. And she said, I can't watch you do this anymore. I can't watch you like the people you're with Tanya, you run. I'm in geriatric healthcare. I hang out with old people all day, you know, but I go home at lunch because my house is nearby and get into all kinds of mischief. And then I come back. And then when I'm too hungover, I take Xanax and ecstasy in the morning to go to work because it makes me more likable. I was doing it for my staff. I'm serious. I'm serious. And then I got fired for erratic behavior. What kind of bullshit is that? 
who does that? <laughs> you know? So, yeah. I asked them to explain it, and their exact words were, we'll make it simple. We just don't want you here. And I was like, erratic behavior is good. That sounds better. We'll go with that. So I have this life that I'm losing job after job. I've literally had my role in every possible community in San Luis Obispo. There's no other jobs for me. So I get fired for erratic behavior. And I get hired in Fresno. Fresno. It's, um, you ever been there? Don't, you don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to. Don't, don't admit that. You know, uh. I get recruited to Fresno, and I am ready. See, because I have this little boy that, you know, if a chocolate lab breeds with a chocolate lab, what's it going to have? Chocolate lab. So, yeah, I'm an alcoholic addict, and I bred with an alcoholic addict, and we threw this pup that's an alcoholic addict, needless to say. And he's realizing that something's not right. You see, I didn't really drink around my kid. I did other things. But I didn't drink around my kid. And he always knew that something's off. Like something's just off, mom. What is wrong? What is wrong? And I couldn't articulate it because everyone just pisses me off. The world's just shitty. You know, this, this, this. I I had no real reason. I couldn't articulate that I need a drink. I am so thirsty right now. And the more I drink, the thirstier I get. You know, I just couldn't explain that to him because it didn't even make sense to me. You know, so when I got recruited to Fresno, he had his dad come over and he said, mom, I'm not going. I'm like, no, you, you got to go, dude. You're my kid. We, we do this. And he's like, no, no, you don't love me. You don't love me like I need to be loved. And I'm staying here with my dad. And he's like 13. And he said, I'm going to stay and play football. But I knew that that wasn't it. And see, in my world, When I look in a mirror, I see this person that's a loser, not dependable, angry, avoids everything and everyone, and I really won't look you in the eyes unless I'm trying to intimidate you, and I'm not going to look my kid in the face because he sees that person now, and I see it on his face, and he's like, you just disgust me. You're disgusting. I see it. So with that big grandiose promise of never. I'm going there and I am getting sober. I swear, Scout's Honor, I am, I am, I am. I I go off to Fresno and there's movers behind me and there's no one waving goodbye. No one, like nobody. I mean, like, yeah. So I get to Fresno, which is a really dark, dark drive. Like it was really dark. Um, And I have this plan that I can't live this way anymore because I've tried to kill myself, by the way, four other times. I'm going to Fresno and I'm going to kill myself as soon as I take all these pills and drink all this booze and I get my house set up because I'm still concerned about image, right? People, I don't want them to find me in boxes because I don't know how long I'll be there because no one knows me in this town except for the seven plenty of fish, Tinder, okay, Cupid dates I lined up one for every single arrival date. I did do that. Every girl needs a backup plan. I did do that, you know? So I, uh, it didn't work out as planned because day number one dude is right here still. So that didn't work out as planned. (laughs) So I go to Fresno and I'm, I'm going to kill myself and I get my house all set up and I meet this guy and I'm like, it's better than dying. Whatever. Fine. Whatever. He likes to drink. That's awesome. So, yeah, like first date, I'm literally saying shit like this. I'm going to fuck you up. Like, I am a human steamroller, and I am just going to flatten you. Like, I'm saying that. Like, it's flatten you. You are a sick individual to be even trying to date me. Get out, run for the hills. Like, I'm saying that. And he's like, oh... She's so broken. <laughs> I can fix her. I can. She needs me. <laughs> All truth, I swear. So we do this thing. We do this thing. And that's in January 27th, 2011. Got sober almost exactly a year later. And I've got this kid and I want to see him. 
and I'm trying so hard to stay sober in between, but the day before that he's supposed to come, I am so uneasy because I know I have to see that look in his eyes and I'm scared and I'm just, I'm sick with myself that I'm living in Fresno, that I hate my life and I just want one drink. Just one drink will help me feel better. And I take that one drink and ruin the whole weekend that he's coming because I'm sneaking and I'm drinking and I'm sneaking and I'm drinking and I'm doing things like going to the movies and buying laptops so they don't have to look me in the face. Don't have to spend time with me, right? Go, let's go to water parks. Don't look at me, you know? So we're doing that. And this guy here used to have a snoring problem. And I wake up one day because he snores so bad and I'm sleeping on the bathroom floor, which is carpeted. And I'm like, I'm out. I don't even like him that much. I'm out. So I tell him that and it's Memorial Day weekend, that weekend. And he's like, I think I snore because I'm an alcoholic. And I'm like, you freaking play the alcoholism card. You are an ass. That's mean. You can't just leave in that. So we go to this program called Celebrate Recovery that weekend. I just heard about it. I have a friend who's very religious. So we go. And dude gets it. Like he's getting it and he's doing it. And I'm like popping Xanax because it's the exact same thing as alcohol. I'm popping Xanax. And then when I go into my house, I'm drinking. And it's time. You do these as a group. These steps as a group. And I've got a little girl over here who's got like anger issues. And I got another one who's got some eating issues. And I have another one who's got like spending issues. And then you got me. And she's like, okay, we're going to do four steps and we're going to read them all to each other. I'm like, oh, hell no, 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 mm -mm. I'm not doing it. I, and I'm like a cat not going in the bathtub. And she, and she, this group leader pulls me aside and she said, Tanya, I think you'll find your people in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was like, what? She's all, you need to go to AA, just go there. And she told me where to go. And I went there and I, I kind of believed it. But he went out of town and then June 30th, I like, I remember looking at this drink and I remember waking up in my bed and stuff had happened in my house that I didn't, wasn't present for. And I said, I think I'm an alcoholic. I think I'm an alcoholic. Something's really wrong. And why can't I have cancer? Why can't I have cancer? And because if I had cancer, someone can fix me. And if I could have fixed me, I would have fixed me a long time ago. I have good reasons to fix me. I don't know how, and I can't do this. So I, I, I went to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I, I, I was so nervous before I went that I took a lot of Xanax so it could calm me down because I felt it was important that I could sit there and listen. And it didn't go well. It didn't go well. It didn't go well. I'm running this assisted living community, and I have this, this – that lady who told me to go, to go to AA calls me, and she's like, Tanya, my sponsor needs a job. And I said, send her in. She's an AA. She'll get me sober. There's got to be a way. I'll just hire this lady because she's sober. So she walks in and she's like, hi, my name's Debbie. I'm here for the job. And I went, you're the sober one, right? And she's like, yeah. I said, give me your resume. Let's walk. And we walked this building and I said, listen, you're hired. You're hired. You're sober like 30 years. You're hired. Talk to me about alcoholism. I think I'm going to die. I, I was that desperate. I was really, really sick. And she's like, it's deadly. I'm not going to mess around with you. It's deadly. Yeah, I've had a lot of people in my, in my circle die. And so I ha she was my secretary for three months, and I would call her in my office often. And I'd be like, you should do that thing you guys do and read the book and sponsor. And she's like, you're my boss. I said, but Debbie, I will um, fire you, and you can get at him because I'm arrogant and I, you're, I'm victimizing you or I'm harming you uh, or using you. And so she says, uh, Tanya, you can't, no, I don't want to be fired. I said, but unemployment's good. I'll supplement the rest. No. I said, disability, it pays more. And she's like, as if I can authorize disability. And so she's, uh, she's watching this progression and she's a good AA -er, and she's quiet, but I see concern on her face and I get fired again two six-figure jobs in a year for erratic behavior. The crazy part is I was sober 17 days at that point. I really gave it a really good try, and I was coming out of my skin. Like, I was so uncomfortable that they came in, and they fired me. And she calls me, and she's like, hey, Tanya, 
I could sponsor you now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, for you. That was good. And, but it stuck. It stuck. It stuck. And I got really sick after that. And it wasn't because I lost the job. It really genuinely wasn't because I lost the job. I was looking at myself going, who is this person? This is not the person I wanted to be. What I would give to go back and have any chapter of my life restated right now. Like, just go back. The crappy first husband. I don't care. Just give me anything. Not this. Not this. But when you looked on the outside, it still wasn't that bad. It was just this internal condition. So I decided I was going to end it. And someone took me to a mental institution. Great place. Great place for me at that time. In Fresno. A little scary. And... I was hearing them talking about me through the walls. Like I was hearing it. And I knew something was really wrong and they let me go. They actually let me go after like five days. And I'm standing in my bathroom. And I don't share this often from the podium. But uh, I'm standing in my bathroom on January 10th, 2012 at 11.02 in the morning with a bottle of Crown Royal in my hand that I haven't opened for five days because I've been locked up, right? And... I'm calling my meth dealer at the porn shop because that's where he was. That's where he worked, actually. That's where I met him, let's be honest. (laughs) And and so I'm calling him because he has $100. Hopefully he doesn't have $100. He should have my stuff. And I call, and they're like, Ricky doesn't work here anymore. I'm like, what? Ricky's my last dude in Fresno. No, no, don't say that. What do you mean? And she's like, Ricky doesn't work here anymore. And I said, he has my money or my drugs. And she hung up on me. And literally, that was my bottom. That was it. That was it. It was game over. I was out of options because I'm very creative. And I will make solutions when they aren't there, even if they're half-assed solutions. And I audibly said to the universe, what the fuck now? That's a prayer. If you don't know that, don't say it. Don't say it. That is a prayer because I meant it. It was, it could have been, I got nothing. Please help me, God. I'm on my knees. I wasn't, I was in my bathroom. But I said that and I knew because this is my story. This is where it gets weird. I heard, Tanya, it's over. You don't love you and I've always loved you. And I don't know what the fuck that was, but I could tell you that it was real because I know that it was real because in that moment, I've never wanted to drink again. Never. Like I felt it like, like, I don't need like a demonic possession. It left my body and I called Debbie and I said, Debbie, Debbie, I don't want to drink. She said, Tanya, it's 11 o'clock in the fucking morning. Don't drink. I said, no, Debbie, (laughs) Debbie, I don't want to drink because see a girl like me, I was a surrogate mom twice. And those babies didn't live because I have to drink. You know, I drank through multiple of my own pregnancies because aren't, isn't that when we're supposed to be proud of who we are and do what we do and help other people and all of those things. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it because that phenomenon of craving and that obsession of the mind is bigger than me, hands down bigger than me. And she said, Tanya, go to a meeting right now, right now. What you have will not last. It's called a moment of clarity. It's a moment that the universe blesses with you with because someone as crazy as you can't even read the book. And I had that moment of clarity and I went to a meeting and this man walked in, his name's John Stewart and he was wearing a suit and he said, how you doing kid? And I'm in sweats and a tank top and flip flops and it's January and it's cold and it's raining. I said, I'm good. I'm good. And he said, your outsides match your insides kid. And I was like, oh, thanks. Uh, that's not a compliment. (laughs) And you know what? He was the kindest person ever to call me on my bullshit. And that image that I had learned in the car on the way to church as a kid about keeping it together and don't let people see. And no one can know what's happening behind the car door, behind the door to the house, behind the door to my heart. That just flew open. And I knew in that moment that it was going to be okay. I knew that there there was things to do because I'd heard on Xanax. And I knew there was work to be done, but I had this willingness. Now I had this eagerness because I saw these people talking in big sentences and I saw them, their message and they were laughing and I hadn't laughed in a long time. And Debbie walked in because she left work and she looked like she had been dipped in glitter. 
You know those women in the pro... She wasn't a stripper. No, you know those... <laughs> no, I don't mean that. <laughs> no. But you know those people that just shine in Alcoholics Anonymous? Those ones that... It's the principles in all their affairs. It's a clean conscience, and it's a higher power of their understanding. And you see it in the eyes. You know, in Bill's story, he saw it in Ebby, and I saw it in her. And she said, we got to get to work. We got to get to work. And I said, Debbie, I'm going to die. And she said, Tanya, you've been dead as long as I've known you. Everything about you is dead. You equate living to a beating heart. That's all life has been reduced to for you is a beating heart. Your family, your children, your dreams, your hopes, your relationships, everything is dead. It's gone. And I probably the first time in many said, fuck you, Debbie. But, but, but she's right. You know, she was right. There wasn't anything left. And I had, was fortunate to have a lot of time because nobody really wanted to be around me at that point. Rightfully so. See, I have abandonment issues. I love to tell people how they're all going to leave. You're all going to, you're just going to leave. You'll leave. And if you don't, I'm going to treat you so poorly that you're going to leave so I could say I told you so. I'm textbook at that stuff. And she wasn't leaving. She wasn't leaving. I knew she wasn't leaving. And she took me through those steps. And she explained that I have a body that once I put alcohol in it, I can't stop. As indicated by my past. Not the book. Not her past. My past. She like would bait me into like admitting things and be like, see, there you go. And then she said, I have a mind of a chronic alcoholic. It's going to keep doing it forever and ever. And it will go back to a drink because he, it still sees it as a solution. And why wouldn't it? It was a solution to my bitchiness for years, you know? So alcohol was a good friend for a long time, really good friend. And she took me through those steps at her pace. And she said, don't be thinking in three weeks, you're going to be telling me how to do this. I got a lot of people who want to go through the steps and you're going to be in my house on Tuesdays, seven o'clock. We're working till nine 30 and I'll work more than that if you want to, but that's the minimum. And we did that. And I worked more because she said something that was really interesting. And I didn't like this after we did step one reading together word for word. That's how I do it too. She said, what are you going to do if you want to drink Tanya? And I was like, handy dandy AA phone list women. Men, other people, 30, 40 years of sobriety on this phone list. I'll call them. And she goes, you didn't remember you had kids. That phone list isn't going to keep you sober. It's not. The, a sponsor is not going to keep you sober. In fact, if the obsession to drink hits, you won't remember AA. And that scared me a lot. That scared me a whole lot. And I was like, what do I do? And she said, you pray your ass off. And I was like, but, but the God thing. And she said, listen, kid, you need to have a spiritual awakening. And I was like, well, how do I do that? And she was like, wow, you are not that smart. <laughs> Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps, you do the steps, you have a spiritual awakening. And then she gave me this release. She said, Tanya, it says, came to believe a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. You don't have to figure out the man with the robe, the guy with the belly. Like you don't have to figure that out. You just have to be willing and do the work. And in the end, you'll get it. You'll get it. And we screw over a lot of newcomers in, in believing that you need to figure out the highest power before we could go to step four. And it doesn't say that. It says a higher power, bigger than me and bigger than whiskey. That's all I needed to do. And my life clearly showed that whiskey was a power greater than me. It dictated everything. And she's like, come on, Tanya. One thing bigger than you and whiskey? Just one? Can you do that? I'm like, hell yeah. If, it's, if you're telling me that. And I did that four step and I read her some secrets and I told her about puking on my baby. And I told her about all the other things that I had done that I swore I would never tell another human being. And she was like, I used to be a hit man for Pablo Escobar. <laughs> I was like, well, then I think I have a couple more secrets to tell you. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> And I left there and she lived about 20 minutes away. I left there and I didn't listen to the radio. Any of you have that? I didn't listen to the radio. I always listen to the radio because when the radio is not on, this is going, you're a bad human. You'll never see those kids again. You'll never get a job. You won't be employable. Your butt's really big. You're going to sit in AA all the time. You're just going to get fatter. No one would want you as a sponsor. That's my head all the time, even now sometimes. And I didn't have that. 
I didn't have that. It was quiet. It was quiet. And it was the first time that I really, really got that this stuff's going to work. It's going to work. I have faith in this. I have faith. I have faith enough to do the rest of it. And I went through those steps and I had to look at myself in six and seven. Cause you know, I used to have this mindset of that's how I roll. You don't like it. That's how I roll. No, that's not. That's called being a bitch. That's not okay. That's called being rude. That's called being judgmental. That's called being disrespectful. You know, that's not how I roll. Like that's not an out. It's not an out, you know? So I did that and I made a list to all people who I, I had harmed, by the way. There's a couple ways to get high in Alcoholics Anonymous. Do those amends. Do those amends. Look the people in the face that you harmed and have them go, you did that? I don't even really remember, bro. Like, we're good. We're good. And you're like, you were nine pages of resentments. And they're like, I only wanted good for you. You know, and then you realize, like, everyone in the world isn't bad. They're not. And some of them even say things like, man, I miss you. I miss you. You know, so um, I made 19 amends in one weekend. Four ex-husbands. What? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Kids, mother-in-laws. Every- oh, yeah. 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 So, and now, now I get to do 10, 11, and 12 every, every day. And I get to speak and I get to share my experience, strength, and hope. And I get to tell you that if you're struggling with alcoholism and you find that you think you can manage it and inevitably you change your mind, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. And the worst part is this is a progressive disease. I gave it to two of my children, maybe a third, I don't know. But I gave it to two. One has a year, one has six months. And I got to hear him, you know, I did my fifth step yesterday, mom. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. You know, alcoholism, I led my kids down a path genetically and behaviorally that that harmed them. And I had to give that to God in the third step and say, your will not mine be done. And inevitably, I didn't have to do that much. I really didn't. And now they're like, Mom, I'm an AA. You taught me that. You taught me that. You know? And that's, Alcoholics Anonymous is a beautiful program, and it really, really works. Ask someone, get a book, read it with them. Read it with them, you know? And, and take these steps, and you don't have to live that, that way anymore. You know, I'll help you. So thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.